I love that feeling of being so enraptured by a novel or a series of books that I just don't want them to end because of the imagination of the, the story, the uniqueness of the point of view, the, the beauty and vividness of the, the language, that I just feel completely lost in this book and I want to wake up early in, in mornings before work and, and read more of it or read it during my lunch hour or late into the night or on weekends and I just want it to go on and on. And there aren't all that many books that have given me this feeling so completely. So I want to point out a number of different books that, that have given me this sensation. Uh, they are by eight different authors. Um, some of them are single titles. Other are parts of series um, that are either directly connected with each other or loosely connected with each other through a, a theme, uh, but which all give me this sensation of, of feeling completely caught up in what I'm reading and wanting it to go on. And I have had the experience recently of a couple of books I've started that I thought, these are quite interesting, I'm, I'm enjoying them, but not feeling completely invested in them. So while I'm reading them, I might put it down and think, oh, what's going on on social media? Or what should I have for dinner tonight? And that's, that's not the, the kind of sense that I wanna have when reading a book um, that I can just kind of leave it to the side and maybe get back to it at some point. I wanna feel like I need to finish reading this. So yeah, all of these books gave me that feeling. So first off, I'm gonna talk about some of the single titles and there's Circe by Madeline Miller. And I was thinking of this just recently because I was debating with somebody in my book club of like, what's the better book, The Son of the Achilles or Circe by Madeline Miller. I mean, I think they're both great books. I, I really loved reading both of them. Um, probably if I had to choose between them, Circe would probably tip over the, the top because of the way she captures the, the story of um, this figure who is a, a nymph from Greek mythology and she's a very solitary and, and lonely figure. She had this sort of difficult upbringing. She's most famously known as uh, sort of uh, taking care and housing uh, Odysseus and some of his sailors on her island and she enchants some of his sailors and turns them into pigs and so um, we get her backstory and how she came to this point in her life and living on this island this very solitary existence um, but she's a very passionate individual uh, but also very scornful um, and she has has a lot of hard things during her upbringing which lead her to this point and what I think is so clever about telling this story is how she tells this story in addition to to it being so imaginative and evocative um, to, to bring this sort of mythology to life and giving a new perspective on it is that you see her point of view as um, someone who in this period when wives were treated as commodities and Cersei refuses to be seen in that way, um, to be taken as, as property and to be sexually used by men. And when men try to do this to her, she fights back and rebels against it. And because of that, she's labeled as rebellious and a witch. And uh, so, so we have this like limited viewpoint of this figure from mythology that, that she's just this creepy figure on an island that enchants sailors in this way. But Madeline Miller sort of shows how there's probably reasoning behind why she um, is this way. And, uh, and I think that's, uh, that's so interesting, gives such an interesting feminist slant to this story and this mythology to, to review um, this, these stories which have been told and retold over the centuries. And uh, I, I think it's so unique and striking and evocative and, and such a wonderful reading experience. But of course, I, I highly recommend The Son of Achilles too. And I'm sure if you loved The Son of Achilles, you'll love this and, and vice versa. Next is another recent contemporary novel, which is Luster by Raven Leilani, uh, which is the, the story of a uh, black woman in her 20s, 
uh, living in New York City and uh, working and her, her struggles in her employment, uh, but also how she starts having an affair uh, with a white man in his 40s who's married but in an open relationship and uh, the evolution of that uh, affair um, to become much more close and personal than the, the man expected as she uh, gradually moves into his household um, and has encounters with his wife but also with their adopted daughter uh, who is also black and uh, so immediately there's uh, all these issues to do uh, with race and identity that are bound up in the the situation um, between these characters um, but how she explores it uh, is so compelling and I, I was just completely gripped by this story which becomes increasingly strange and almost dreamlike as we follow her um, and living in this this household and and she's this um, kind of intruder upon it but um, but also um, gives this entirely different perspective on this situation and family and um, the, the whole dynamics of, of this that I, I just thought was so compelling and fascinating and, and uh, so yeah I was completely gripped by this book. Um, this is Raven Leilani's debut novel. Hopefully she'll write more and publish more um, because uh, yeah what an interesting new voice. I have another contemporary novel uh, that was first published in 1984 which is Nights at the Circus by Angela Carter um, who's such a fascinating English author um, that explored uh, issues to do with folklore and fairy tales uh, and gave this really interesting feminist slant on them and in this novel we have the character of Fevers, uh, who is a circus performer and the sort of story behind her is that she was hatched from an egg and um, so she has wings uh, but um, and uh, but also yeah wasn't sort of born directly from a, a mother she was she was hatched from an egg and so she's in in some ways uh, sort of self created and we follow her journeys um, through her adventures through the circus and encounters with various different individuals who have different plans and schemes for her um, which she has her own ideas about things and uh, it's such an imaginative and wondrous novel uh, that that I was I was so gripped by uh, this this story following um, through her various different adventures and encounters um, that I, I just loved it and uh, yeah I think it's a novel that should be more well known and remembered but um, but if you enjoy this like I said um, Angela Carter sort of gave this really interesting slant in her fiction informed by all these different histories of storytelling um, that uh, I'm sure you'll really enjoy her other work. Next I want to go back to a classic novel from the early to mid 1800s in France, uh, The Black Sheep by Honoré de Balzac. Uh, this novel is primarily about uh, two brothers. Uh, one is the kind of favored son um, who grows up to become an officer but who also has big problems with drinking and gambling. And then his brother um, who is more artistically inclined and uh, whose mother sees that as much more problematic in how he follows through in his his life and so we we follow the the story of these two brothers and this whole sense how in some families you know there is a kind of favored child um, despite anything that that child does you know they're still kind of uh, in the good graces of the the parents whereas there's uh, can be other children that are just kind of more pushed to the side and and not really given the respect or attention that they deserve and so how he follows that through um, through the the lives of these characters and their encounters and many like dramatic occurrences um, is so compelling and uh, I, I just love the way that Balzac writes and uh, he brings so much vibrancy and life to his characters that you really believe that they exist. And of course Balzac uh, create, wrote so many novels so if you 
enjoy this or enjoy another book by Balzac, you have the entire human comedy that he, he wrote um, in many different novels of, um, and some characters that intersect. And I'm so staggered and amazed that an author can have the imagination to entirely recreate a whole society like this and fictionalize it in, in a way which is so compelling and lively uh, that I, I just want to read more and more of him. Now I want to get into some series of books where the, the writing and the stories are so good that I'm glad they weren't limited to a single volume, that uh, there were more and more books that I could go and continue reading on about them. Uh, so first off, uh, there's Edmund White, um, who wrote a trilogy of books that were kind of autobiographically inspired um, and which also encapsulate uh, gay life in the latter half of the, the 20th century. So uh, we starts with uh, a boy's own story in the 1950s, which describes a boy's childhood and adolescence and his growing queer sensibility and how that's expressed, and uh, but also his desire for culture and uh, life beyond the borders of um, the, the town and the family that he's born into. Uh, and then it follows on with The Beautiful Room is Empty, uh, which follows continuing on um, in his adolescence and early adulthood in uh, the, the, 19, the late 1950s and 1960s as um, he's establishing himself in the world and finding a community beyond the boundaries of his hometown and his family life and uh, and it ends um, really strikingly with the Stonewall riots, which have become so symbolic as the beginning of like the gay liberation movement and um, and towards uh, queer rights. And uh, then it ends with the, the Farewell Symphony, um, which is much larger than the other books, but that's because it encompasses a much larger period of time from the 1960s through to uh, I think the, the early 1990s, um, as we follow his life and and many different uh, relationships, sexual encounters, uh, but also his his work struggles um, and his uh, his changing position within uh, this queer community that he's found, and uh, obviously through the the AIDS crisis and um, the calamitous events um, surrounding that um, that impact him both personally, but the community and the country around him. And uh, so together, yeah, they, they form such a striking portrait of an individual's life and evolving existence, but also the, the changing period of, of time and um, the, uh, the raising awareness of uh, the, the gay community um, over the second half of the 20th century. And so, um, yeah, so wonderful for that reason. And I was thinking about this because uh, just recently um, there was a graphic novel version of A Boy's Own Story that was just published. I think it's only been published in America, not here in the UK. So I'm so eager to get a hold of a copy and see how the story has been reimagined in visual form. But also, I would just so highly recommend reading all three of these books. Um, his power of storytelling um, is, is so epic um, and, and, and he has this wonderful style which um, I hesitate to characterize it as a kind of gossipy style because that makes it sound more lowbrow than it actually is. Um, but, but it is this way where it feels like the author is whispering in your ear these stories um, which are so compelling and intriguing that you just want to keep reading on. Next I have a quartet of novels um, which have become a recent favorite which are the Lucy Barton series by Elizabeth Strout and uh, so these um, unlike Edmund White's novels um, apparently aren't at all autobiographically inspired but is obviously a character that Strout has found so fascinating and haunting that she's continued to write about her through a series of, of different books. Books. 
books. <laughs> so it all begins with my name is Lucy Barton, where we um, follow her in um, a period when she was in the hospital um, and when her mother comes to visit her and the very strained relationship between these two characters. And we learn about their complicated relationship and Lucy's um, difficult upbringing in very impoverished circumstances and how she's grown to become uh, a quite prominent writer um, and uh, so and uh, and has married and had a family and um, so yeah we um, were introduced to her that way and then in anything is possible we get a series of short stories um, which go back to Lucy's hometown and so we see a number of characters that were connected to her in this hometown and get their individual stories and um, which are fascinating on their own, but uh, also had this larger emotional meaning because we understand them in relation to Lucy Barton. And um, so is gives such an interesting different perspective on her life. And then we have um, the more recent two novels, uh, Oh William and uh, Lucy by the Sea, um, where we follow her continuing relationship with her first husband who she had divorced, um, but um, who um, she meets again and uh, she assists him in O. William in going to the state of Maine where he tries to track down this long lost sister that he never knew he had. And so in doing, um, we, we see their evolving relationship, which has continued to go on, you know, despite them being divorced. Um, they're, they're connected through the daughters that they have, um, but, but also they still have this emotional connection to each other, which is continuing to change and grow, you know, despite having established individual lives for themselves um, that are separate. And then in Lucy by the Sea, we follow her through the recent events of the, the pandemic and um, how William sort of takes her into Maine to, uh, to kind of go into to hiding why all this is taking place and to try to keep her safe and um, yes her relationship with William continues to evolve and so it's a really striking um, look at uh, at romance not in you know the the early stages but in the later stages of life but also her as an individual the way we get more of a sense of her life and her complicated past and her understanding of identity like across these four different books is so wonderfully compelling and and gripping that even though um, I had a slightly uneven experience that I didn't enjoy a William quite as much as the other two books when it came to Lucy by the Sea I was just completely brought back into um, her tale and uh, and wanting to understand this really unique individual and her relationship to memory and uh, and time um, that it's it's so well done and it's written in this style which is very easy to read and down to earth and almost conversational um, but in doing so she she slips in so much more meaning um, than you know what we would have in just talking to each other about our pasts in in this way. Um, so it's it's uh, yeah so clever. A graphic memoir series that I absolutely loved is the Arab of the Future books by Riyad Satouf. Uh, in these titles, um, he tells the story of his life and his very unique perspective as the son of a Syrian father and a French mother. And uh, so his, his father um, kind of says that he is going to be uh, the Arab of the future. And we follow his story from his birth through his childhood and adolescence up into his teenage years, um, living in various countries in the Middle East, but also France and the, uh, the tensions um, between his parents and his changing family life over that period of, of time, but also the changing politics of, of the time and um, this very different perspective he gets in these various different countries that he, he lives in. And uh, the, the way he writes about this and draws this gives such a lighthearted and comic slant to um, these events, which um, are very personal and some of them are quite um, tense and, and tragic. But, uh, but the way he, he shows it um, makes it so lively. And, and so I was like frequently laughing throughout these books, but also I felt the real 
heartache um, of his story and um, the, the difficulties that um, all the members of his family and himself experienced over these periods of, of time. Um, so yeah, we, we follow his story um, beginning in the, the late 1970s um, through to the 1980s. Um, so I have read three volumes of um, these books. Um, there is a fourth which um, has been translated into English and then there's also a fifth um, which I don't think has been translated yet and which is still just in, in French but, um, but which I hope is translated and apparently he's also going to be writing a final volume, a sixth volume of um, this, this series. But, um, but yeah, the, the way he writes is just so wonderful and I was just, uh, I was just completely caught up in his story. And finally, uh, we have my favorite author, uh, Joyce Carol Oates, and her gothic pentology? Um, that's the word for it, isn't it? Isn't it? Whoa! Great. That's the danger of trying to hold up a big pile of books, especially when they have these slippery uh, slip covers. And I almost ruined my geeky signed first edition of this book um, because of that kind of defeats the purpose of having protection on this book, isn't it? Anyway, um, so the, these um, anyway were five novels written over a long period of time by Joyce Carol Oates um, in which she kind of utilized some of America's most popular genres of books, um, but kind of reconfigured them to give this uh, really unique and literary slant on them, but which are also so wonderfully written and compelling that I, I found them really gripping and uh, just wonderful to, to read. Um, so uh, the, it started off with Belle Fleur, which is a family saga um, following this uh, wealthy and influential family and their um, their their fortunes and um, fates and difficulties that they the individuals in this family experience over a long period of time and we get each of their stories there are so many unique characters in this which are really compelling and wonderful to read about and it's all centered around this big lavish mansion that is built in uh, upstate New York and um, which they inhabit and um, and as the novel goes on there are various supernatural sort of things which uh, occur in this there there are ghosts um, there's uh, a sort of mystical cat or not, not mystical cat but like a, a cat that kind of um, is uh, grows larger over a period of time and and becomes almost yeah supernatural and uh, and the, 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 there's so many scenes in this that really stick out in my mind and that I remember so well um, and it's such an interesting way of looking at kind of American ambition and um, and American ideals um, through this this lens of this this family tree um, going down the line and I just love a, a family saga um, and then next we have a Bloodsmore romance um, which is obviously sort of playing upon the romance novel and the the various stories of a number of sisters and their encounters in love and hate and uh, so following them through a series of dramatic events. Um, then we have Mysteries of Winterthorn, which is sort of playing on the detective novel and we have this uh, detective um, which is looking into these cases, some of which um, do tip over into the, the supernatural and it begins with this very dramatic uh, event um, which is so haunting and powerful um, that yeah I, I really remember it um, but but yeah through a series of different cases that he's investigating to do with a number of different murders um, then we have my heart laid bare which follows a family of con artists over a period of of time and um, the way that these con artists sort of shapeshift into um, different identities um, says so much about like the nature of being like beyond the the stories themselves which are really compelling and, and gripping and so tantalizing in how they um, sort of live outside of normal laws and normal senses of morality and then finally um, the most recent book in the series is the accursed um, which is this uh, this kind of vampire um, gothic um, supernatural story which also involves 
Charles' um, really interesting slant on history and on the figure of Woodrow Wilson, um, who was president of Princeton University, where Joyce Carol Oates taught for many, many years um, before Woodrow Wilson became president. And um, following his uh, uh, the, a series of dramatic events that, that occur um, and this history, um, a lot of it to do um, with racism and slavery, um, which hasn't been um, which hasn't been dealt with and which intrudes upon the present of these characters. And um, yeah, it is such an enticing tale. Um, so yeah, these, these books all together um, form this really interesting look at America, but also tell so many different stories that are um, all equally gripping and imaginative and really wild in, in the, the scope of, um, well, I think Joyce Carol's is primarily known for this more kind of like psychological realism that she uses, which is like evident in these novels, but she, I think, allows in these books her imagination to just run wild and, um, and so tells these tales, which are so compelling and wonderful um, that, that, yeah, I, I just think they're, they're absolute classics. Um, so those are all the books I, I want to talk about. I'd love to know if you've read any of these books, if you felt the same way, if you felt equally gripped by all these books as I was, um, or if you want to tell me about some other books um, that gave you that, that feeling that you just had to keep reading on and that you wished and hoped that there would be, that the story would continue, you know, beyond the end of the book and that hopefully the author would, would keep writing about them. Um, so yeah, if there are series like this, which have really struck you and um, which you think are all really well done, um, I'd love to hear about that in the, the comments below. But I hope you're doing well and reading good things. I'll speak to you again soon. Bye-bye.